All right, guys. Um, happy to be here. Thanks for having me to the event. Um, actually, I'm a lifelong hockey player. Was a USA card holder for a long time. Went through Maha. Um, I started playing hockey at seven in Flint at Iceland Arena for the Icebreakers. Um, played all over the Southeast Michigan area. And my oldest son, Nolan, now who is seven, just did his first hockey camp last week. So um, the presentation before was pretty interesting to me to live through some of that time and play through some of that time and remember when Pee Wee. Uh, didn't have full body checking. I was old enough to have full body checking when I was in Pee Wee. Um, many concussions were uh, taken through those years. But I um, just want to say thanks for having me. I want to preface a few things about AFSP and about the presentation we're going to see today. If you have been affected by the issue of suicide, if you've lost a loved one or a friend or a student or a coach or whatever it might be, um, some of the information is geared about prevention. So this is all about prevention and awareness and getting ahead of the curve. So if you have lost, I'm sorry for that loss. We have many, many programs around the state to help you with that loss, to connect you with other people who have had a loss, um, and to really shed light on how we can help stem this issue. Um, and it starts with this presentation today. It's about a 40-minute presentation. We're going to buzz through it. I know I'm one of the last speakers of the day, so thanks for sticking with me. Um, but about me, as I said, I do have three kids, um, Nolan, Cameron, and Steven. They are seven, five, and one. Uh, I had a little baby girl last year. And so this really uh, worries me as not only a parent, but as a community member, um, as a youth advocate, as somebody who works with college students and high school students on this issue as well. Um, you guys have an extremely important role and you're in an amazing place to make a difference in this. Um, the whole premise of this is those three words, that talk saves lives, talking to people. And I can remember the relationships that I formed with coaches and teammates and the camaraderie I had and the safety and the compassion we have for each other. And so um, what we talk about today, you can take back into your communities, to your teams, to your organizations, your workplaces, even if you'd like it there. Um, the slide deck is available and is actually scripted. Um, if you want to get my information later, we can connect. I can come out and do it if you're um, close enough. Um, if not, we can find a local volunteer. We do have our chapter statewide. So all the way from Marquette down to Kalamazoo to Monroe, we are all over the state. So if you do need anything from us ever, please make sure to follow up with me after the event, um, and we'll get you connected with any resources or services. So we're going to jump in. Um, so this is uh, an issue about a health issue. So suicide is a health issue. It's not a moral issue. It's not a character issue. Um, suicide is an, a, a world health issue. Um, but it is preventable. We know that, and sometimes, like I said, if you have had a loss, um, this isn't meant to instill guilt that we missed some signs or that we didn't reach out to our loved one in time, but um, our science and research shows that suicide is preventable. What we're going to talk about today are these four quick things, um, stats, research, prevention, what we know works, and then what can you do. So that last section is really the, the important part of it. I do have a brochure I'll leave on the back table along with some bracelets if you want to snag them. Um, all of the information in that what can you do section is housed in the brochure. So it's a great takeaway. It's a great piece to have with you. Or if you need to have this conversation one day with a parent or a student or a player, um, it's a great thing to have on hand. So what's happening? So every year over 800,000 people die by suicide worldwide. What that means is that in the 40 minutes it takes me to give this presentation, at least 10 people around the world will die by suicide. Here in the state of Michigan, someone dies by suicide about every seven hours. So it is the 10th leading cause of death in our state overall. For the ages of 15 to 34, suicide is the second leading cause of death for our youth in a very critical age of their life. Um, nationwide as well, um, it is the 10th leading cause of death. Um, we just got the CDC numbers. If you we're familiar or saw it all when Kate Spade died by suicide or Anthony Bourdain that same week the CDC released a report. Um, so it's been in the news a lot, but we're trying to get the awareness up and bring it down. Um, this number did go up. So in 2016, we know that nearly 45,000 people died. So it was about 40, 44,962, I think was the count. Um, so it is on the rise. And so it is an issue that we're experiencing and we need to pay more attention to. Um, for every suicide death that there is, at least 25 people are attempting to take their life. These attempts we know are only the recorded attempts. So there was police intervention, there was hospitalization, there was some sort of catalog or documentation of this attempt. So that is not even counting all the attempts that we don't hear about or that families brush under the rug or students don't talk about. But what that equates to is about a million Americans every year are attempting to take their life. We also know that a suicide affects a large amount of people. So for every death, at least 100 people are affected by this death. 
And we also know that suicide grief is much more complex than normal loss. All loss is terrible, whether it's to cancer or diabetes or natural causes, but we do know that the grief of suicide is much more complex and it affects a very large community when this does happen. Uh, economically, just to look at it from a numbers perspective, we talk a lot with law lawmakers and um, our elected officials. Suicide costs the nation $51 billion a year in lost wages and productivity. That's due to the person who's died by suicide, and that's due to that ripple effect that we feel in those who are affected by this issue as well. When someone does die, those around them affected, again, have that loss of wage and productivity. So the research. So AFSP is the largest funder of suicide prevention research, second only to the federal government. So we spend a lot of the local dollars that we raise on research that's nationwide, the best cutting edge research, and we've been able to develop a few things out of there. And the main thing is this slide, that there's no single reason someone dies by suicide. We hear it blamed on bullying, we hear it blamed on a job loss, we hear it blamed on a uh, loved one dying or that uh, a relationship ended, but there's no single reason. There can be a precipitating event that takes that person kind of over the edge, but we know that it's a multitude of factors. We also know that over nine out of 10 people who die by suicide have a diagnosable mental illness at the time of their death. It could be major depression, it could be bipolar, it could be schizophrenia, personality disorder, but nine out of 10 of them have this issue. Now this issue could have been undiagnosed, it could have been misdiagnosed, it could have been self-medicated, and it could have been wrongly medicated. But what we do know is that mental illness is the underlying factor in all of suicides. Some positive, though, about mental illness is that we also know that one in four Americans suffer from or manage a mental illness. Not a quarter of the country is dying by suicide. So even though it plays a very large role in suicide, not every person who manages a mental illness is suicidal. And not every person who has a mental illness is going to end up having suicidal ideation or be at risk even. What we want to talk about there is treatment and opportunities and access and affordability to care and making sure that we're receiving the proper care. Something else we discovered through our research is that the physical makeup of someone's brain is different once they've died by suicide. So the way that the brain is actually connecting hemisphere to hemisphere, synapse to synapse, it is physically rewired. The way that we can relate to this is that if I took this computer and this hardware and all this audiovisual stuff up here and I tried to rewire it and expect the exact same result, it wouldn't happen. But the scary part of it is, is that those misfunctions and those rewiring happen in the form of function and structure, specifically in decision making and long term thought. So two of the things that you need in a moment of crisis, think about what's next and what do I do now, are not operating correctly. We also know that people who are suicidal are ambivalent about death. There is a side of them that wants to live, but because of what they've been going through, they have developed this other side that does want to die. And what that brings them to is a crisis point. There's been this point that's been reached where they're in indescribable, unbearable pain. Now this pain could be physical, emotional, it could be psychological, but the brain processes pain in the exact same way. No matter if it is a broken arm or if it's something inside your head, you feel the exact same pain. As we learned, their brain function and structure is different, so their thinking becomes limited, they make irrational decisions, and then, then if there's any introduction of a physical substance or alcohol abuse or drug abuse, that then again affects further the functionality of the brain. What we're looking to the future, though, to understand even more, because there's so many more questions that are still involved in this issue and we need more and more research, are these areas. We're looking for biomarkers, things that we can help detect mental illnesses earlier in someone's life, just as if you know you're at a disposition for kidney disease or heart disease because your family has had it and it's a genetic issue. We want to look for that with mental illness as well. We're studying interventions and more easy ways to intervene when someone's in crisis and ways that we can put into structure of society that there is no access to some of these lethal means that people are using to take their life. We're looking at psychotherapies and medication. So everything from talk therapy to go see a counselor once a month to medication and DBT and these things that we're trying to figure out what will work to help manage someone's illness. Mental illness is not like physical illness. Physical illness, we a lot of times will take a pill for two or three weeks or take my amoxicillin when I get bronchitis and then I'm done and it goes away. Mental illness is like heart disease. Mental illness is like cancer. Mental illness is like diabetes. We have to manage this and learn to live our lives so that we're still productive and healthy. So we've also discovered a lot about who's at risk. So who are those that are most at risk to die by suicide? 
And the person who's most at risk is here in the center. When these three factors come together of environmental, health, and historical, somebody can have a heightened risk for suicide. Health factors are mental health, about how we take care of our mental health. And mental health and mental illness are two different things. A mental illness is a diagnosable illness that you've developed or your brain has taken on. Mental health is how do you safeguard yourself from that illness. We're looking, though, at people who have depression. They're at much higher risk. Depression is a major issue with our youth right now, as well as anxiety. I know that my sister has bipolar disorder, so we know that she's a little heightened risk from um, the issue of suicide. But also, substance abuse disorders, personality disorders, eating disorders should be on this slide. It's not yet, but an eating disorder is actually a mental illness. We're also looking at chronic physical illnesses. We know that 91% of our mental health patients have at least one physical chronic illness as well, whether it's back pain or, again, diabetes or some sort of hip replacement. Uh, they have another illness. Um, serious head injuries are another big thing, as you know, we talk a lot about in youth sports with football and peewees and these things like hockey, less and less physical contact at a younger age. Um, and also chronic pain. So again, the dependency on a painkiller or an ability to be able to be out of pain through non-natural sources. Historical factors are big because this is something that we're still trying to bring our country to talk about. We're trying to get them to have the same conversations about, well, your grandmother had cancer, or your grandfather died of heart disease, or your, your mother had a stroke. And so you, these, these conversations that have taken decades for our, our culture and our country to come around to have these conversations about, I used to do breast cancer. So I used to work for the American Cancer Society before AFSP. And I could wear pink, and I could have a shirt that says, I love tatas and save second base, and all these things. And people didn't bat an eye, because after so long, it became OK to talk about your grandma's boobs. And did she have breast cancer? You know, We had to have that conversation over and over and over again to make it natural. We're not having this conversation about mental illness or if someone in the family did die by suicide. So many, so many times do we hear that my uncle died, or my grandfather died, or my own father died. My family didn't talk about it. It was an accident. We didn't let anybody know. That's a huge, dirty secret in a lot of households. We also look at child abuse, sexual or physical abuse, and a child can actually um, heighten their risk for suicide as well, um, and previous suicide attempts. If someone's made an attempt before, they're obviously a little higher risk to um, make another attempt and die by suicide. Environmental is key as well because it's about the world that's around us and the world that we live in. Prolonged stress and stressful life events are something that, again, can help precipitate the risk of a suicide but wouldn't be the single reason that it happened. We also need better coping skills for our youth and for even adults nowadays that are having these job transitions and loss of industry. With the 0708 crash of the economy, a lot of people had to retool their own lives. And so these stressful life events can add a lot to someone's mental health load. Access to lethal means is key, um, and this isn't just a firearm. This could be access to painkillers. This could be access to a high building or a high ledge. Uh, this could be access to a car or a motor vehicle that you would have. Um, so access is key as well. And the top one I say for last because exposure and contagion is really real. And this happened a lot when we saw the Kate Spade and Anthony Bourdain death, when we saw the Chris Cornell death in, in Detroit, we saw the Chester Bennington death. Um, Reporters and media are covering these issues as a sensationalized story of romance or this star-crossed rock star or this man who had it all or this woman who broke down. You know, the, the way that we talk about this issue does have serious effect on those who are suffering. So there is research, and it does prove you will never put the idea of suicide in someone's head by talking about it or asking about it. What exposure and contagion is important to remember, it's those who we've already missed, those who are in unbearable pain, those who have hit that crisis point. We have to lead them to resources and outlets and ways to help them with what they're dealing with. So if you've seen the 13 Reasons Why, or if you saw the CNN Anderson Cooper special, that was AFSP that did that. And the entire time, they have the crisis hotline on the bottom of the screen. They have the crisis text line on the bottom of the screen. And so, Giving proactive messaging and proactive results to these people who are reading these stories is a really big piece of it. And we work every day with the media. And actually, the Associated Press, in their style guide, took out the word committed. When you're supposed to write about a story about suicide, you're not supposed to use the word committed. And it's actually against AP style if you do. So here's a quick example. And this is what research has shown us is the problem with suicide at its core, really, is that here's a death. And so we'll use me as an example. Um, Steve dies by suicide. 
and it was right after I had a divorce. So as you know, I have three small kids. I have my wife, um, we have a home, and we have all these great things. I came to AFSP two and a half years ago. Um, we had a rental unit that burnt down. I lost my, I, my car, got in a wreck, um, and then a couple other things happened, and then we, we got divorced, and I killed myself. That's all you see, and this is the problem when the outside world looks in. When a child dies by suicide, it was the bullying. When a man dies by suicide, it was a job loss or a relationship. When a woman dies by suicide, it was a break. There's always this reason people try and pin on it, and that's completely and falsely inaccurate. Because what none of us knew and what you didn't know was that, again, my sister has bipolar. My mother had major depression. My grandfather died by suicide. I was diagnosed with depression when I was 14 years old in high school. Managed it for a little while. I went off to college and thought the world would be really great. And then I had to start self-medicating with drugs and alcohol. I got my new job, which put a ton of stress on me at home. More hours, more work, less relationship. And then I started drinking more started using more drugs, started drinking a little more, and that drinking and, and alcohol abuse made my depression worse, which made my work suffer, which made me get on the hot seat with my boss, and then my wife left me, and then I died. So you don't know this. You don't know all of the things that converge when someone dies by suicide. As we said earlier, there's no single reason. It is the intersection of many, many life events that come together and someone cannot cope. So how do we prevent this? So what do we know works? What we know is that there's main protective factors for someone to not die by suicide. These are mental health care, which is the most important piece of the puzzle, to get people into care for mental illness. Family and community support. This is awesome for what you guys do. Our teams are our families. I still have buddies from mine from my U6 team that I still talk to. I hang out with his kids and he hangs out with mine. These are, this is a place that you guys have, the sports field, this community, these coaches. Family and community support is key. To be open, to talk, to be okay and remove the stigma within that community. Problem solving skills. ADM is a great thing to teach kids how to achieve, how to compete, and again, it talks a lot about when is the right age to put that much stress on them, that much competition, that much expectation on them. So problem solving skills. I know that when I had my first child and I was 22 years old, I had to relearn a lot of problem solving skills. I could no longer put my fist through the wall when I got mad about something. That's a really bad example to set for my kids. I had to find new ways to deal with my problems. And cultural and religious beliefs. This is something that takes all of us. This takes our village, this takes our world, this takes everyone to be able to be understanding and educated about this issue of suicide. But the biggest piece is time. And time is key because it's time away from those lethal means time connected with that ambivalent side, the person who's not ambivalent about death. You wanna separate them from triggers and responses in the community that might connect them to that ambivalent side. Time with things that they care about, time with those community support systems and their family, and time to get treatment. Treatment really takes a lot of time with mental illness. We think about walking into the doctor as taking a pill and I'm great. That's Western medicine for us. That does not work with our brains. But again, we harp on this a lot, and this slide, again, it's just that mental health is the key ingredient. The problem, though, in mental care, mental health care, mental health, and managing your mental illness, we know that only two out of five people are actually seeking professional help. A lot of us think that we can just go blow off steam with our buddies. A lot of us think that I can go to the golf range, I can go to the shooting range, I can go throw back a couple beers on a Saturday night and vent to my boys. This doesn't work. Treatment is just as real as if you had diabetes. You wouldn't go to the bar to treat your diabetes, so we can't go to do these things that aren't actual real treatment. Treatment is seeing a mental health professional. Too many times our family doctors, our primary care physicians, or our pediatricians are prescribing antidepressants to our youth when they have no formal training or, or education in this process. Of all the years that our doctors spend in physical medicine school, in med school, in residency, there's about 30 minutes of mental health training in there. So for someone who, again, is in a mindset of, you have these three symptoms, here's my flow chart, here's the medication and dosage in milligrams for what you weigh, this will take care of your problem. It doesn't work that way. You could give six different people the same exact dosage and the same exact antidepressant, and each of them will have wildly different side effects and different responses to that medication. So we need to see a real mental health professional, a psychologist, a psychiatrist, a counselor, a therapist, someone who can actually deal with this. We need to get an evaluation. There's a, simple, there's a simple test that we can take. If you're honest and open with the test, it'll come back whether or not you do have an issue. 
And what you do have is up to you. Your diagnosis does not define you. And every single person's treatment plan is what their own is. There is no silver bullet. There is no, you know, you have this issue. Mental illness is on a spectrum. So there's bipolar one, there's bipolar two, there's chronic depression, there's major depression, there's cyclical depression. There's so many things that no, not many of us are aware of that we are afraid to go and take that first step because we're, we're afraid to be labeled with depression. But it's not that simple. The other cool thing though, and some of the things that we've been working on are laws about mental health care and accessibility and affordability. The National Mental Health Parity Law passed in 2008 under the Bush administration before he left office. And what that did is it stated that if you work for an employee of 50 employees or employer of 50 employees or more, your mental health copay is the exact same as your physical health copay. Now the insurance loophole is that does that provider take your insurance? So the sad fact of this though is that in the upper peninsula of our state, there is not a single licensed child psychologist. There are mental health professionals, there are people you can go see, but in the entire UP, there is not one that specializes in youth. And that part of our state drives our rate up very high. Yes, thank you. But there is good news, right? So there are laws, there are things we're working towards. Michigan actually is in the process right now to pass our own state level mental health parity bill. So we go to Lansing every year, as it was said in the introduction, and we have a state capital day. So talking to your elected officials and meeting with your representatives is something that's passionate about you um, with the issue of suicide prevention and mental health awareness. We'd love to have you join us. It's every May. So you can, you can look that up at our website, afsp.org slash Michigan. But the other piece of it too is this mental health care. So again, mental illness and mental health are two different things. Just like a cancer patient, just like a diabetic patient, we have to help alter our lifestyle. We have to have good exercise and take care of our bodies. Youth sports does that inherently. I played hockey and soccer and lacrosse and baseball and every sport that I can really remember. I did BMX as a kid. Um, and so we have to get exercise. We have to have healthy eating habits, which usually come pretty inherent to our athletes. And youth sports is another form of stress management. So again, what we do here, what you guys do here is very important and it can be a key ingredient to helping youth with their mental health. But this last piece here is sleep. Sleep is the most important thing for any mental health patient. A regular sleep schedule, same wake, same bedtime. Your brain goes through phases and modes when you sleep. And for someone whose brain is not currently functioning correctly and we're in the process of managing an illness, their sleep is a key ingredient to what they're gonna have success. And then this is the biggest piece as well, limiting access to means. These are CO2 sensors in cars that, there's actually a federal law that states that the air in a car has to cycle so many times per minute. So we have some safeguards there that the use of the automobile and the exhaust fumes is actually no longer that high of a risk sometimes with a suicide in a newer vehicle. Uh, barriers on bridges. The San Francisco Golden Gate Bridge is the highest point of suicide in the nation. Um, they have recently put up a barrier that's about a six foot net below the bridge. And when they put that up, we saw a reduction in suicides in the entire region, not just at that one point of access. Blister packaging on medication. I used to hate this because I have allergies and when I had to take and peel off the foil and then peel off another foil and then get these little pills out and this blister packaging to make it not as easy to get a, a free bottle of medication dumped onto the table, that's about time. So those medications that have a lethal dosage at a certain level, you'll see them in blister packaging because it takes more time to get that medication out to a lethal dose and then give that person time to pass through their crisis. And then securing firearms, this is a big piece. Um, we are working with the National Sports Shooting Foundation, it's the NSSF, and they represent retailers and gun ranges and trainers and the, the guys who are out there training people to use firearms. We're talking about the fact that this is not a Second Amendment issue, this is not a policy issue, this has nothing to do with anything about what you believe in with rights and all that. This is about education. So the fact that one third of our homes in America have a firearm in them, this is about educating every single firearm owner, the same thing we're learning here today. Signs and symptoms and risk of suicide and how to step in when you're worried about someone. We're also talking about safe storage and education. So again, this is a big initiative that we've launched, but it's not about policy. The other piece of it too in prevention is those who have lost. So we said earlier on the other slide that 100 people are affected when there is a suicide in the community. Those who lose someone to suicide have a heightened risk for a mental illness to set in. In this time of extreme grief and stress, this time of loss, 
Um, if they don't receive counseling and treatment, we see a very high rate of mental illness setting in, which then puts them at an increased risk of their own suicide. And then lived experience survivors. These are people who have made previous attempts. This is something that stigma is a major issue with us uh, in the country, and we at AFSP bring the community together in a light that if you have made an attempt, we invite you, we respect you, we understand it was an illness, we understand that this is something that you do not need to be judged on, because we also know that 75% of all attempt survivors, when they receive treatment, go on to never have another attempt again. So we know it's just a tough spot. We know that they're there, and we're happy they're still with us. So we don't want to push them away with our mission. So here's the heart. Here's the good part. This is the meat and potatoes. This is what we want to learn. This is what, what can you do? And honestly, it's as simple as this. Have a conversation. This can be one of the scariest conversations to ever have because you don't want the wrong answer. You don't want to ask someone, are you thinking about suicide? And then to say yes, because what do you do? I, but honestly, before I came to AFSP, I had lost two really close friends of mine to suicide. I never had this conversation. And now they're not with us anymore. And so it was scary for me. And it still will be tough now. Even with what I do every single day, I had to learn and had to, I had to psych myself up if I'm ever going to have this conversation, if I'm worried about someone. It's a simple stop process. We're going to have a conversation. And what leads us to that conversation is through the warning signs. We're going to go through those warning signs in a second. But we reach out. We have that conversation. And we get help. We seek help. And then again, that's not let's go talk on the driving range or let's go do some retail therapy or let's go do something else. This is real help, mental health professionals. The warning signs are three simple words, talk, behavior, and mood. I try and liken this to stop, drop, and roll. Uh, I have three kids. Um, I learned stop, drop, and roll since I, I don't even remember when you learn it. It's just, I feel like it's natural in our country now. Has anyone ever had to use stop, drop, and roll? No one in this room has been on fire. Me either. And I can tell you that my four-year-old and my seven-year-old boys, Stephen and Nolan, they know stop, drop, and roll. If they have to use stop, drop, and roll, I'm not probably the dad of the year this time around. So it's amazing what we teach our kids when what we need to teach them is what they're going to use. I guarantee you that my two boys and my little girl at one point in their life will use talk, behavior, and mood. They will have a friend, possibly it could be themselves, it could be a teammate, it could be someone that they're worried about, and they're noticing talk, behavior, and mood. The talk is, again, this is not just verbal talk. This is texting, this is media posts, this is comments and anger. These are things that we're listening for and looking for in people who we're worried about. Talking about ending their lives. Oh, I should just kill myself, like I'm not worth it. Uh, I, I feel hopeless every day, I'm angry, I'm sad, I'm mad. You know, we, we have no reason to live. Uh, the world will be better off without me. I'm such a burden on everyone. Um, we see a lot of this in young people. We see a lot of this in people of transition in their life when there's a hardship, if they lose their job. I know that my father, um, he and my mother were divorced since I was six years old, and I think that's why I probably got into hockey. My mom needed to fill my time up. But um, he moved back in with his parents at 40 years old after a job loss. And I can only imagine like, what that would feel like as a, as a father and a man to have to move back home with my parents at 40. So... You know, there's all this talk. These things can come out when people are frustrated or angry or when they're inebriated or intoxicated or when you're having a face-to-face -face conversation or in a journal or on a Facebook post. But these things are verbalized in many, many ways. Their behavior. The behavior we're looking for is a change from the status quo. Now, this change could have happened 10 years ago. And now we're finally looking at this slide and we're saying, wow, I know someone who's exhibiting these behaviors or they did back then. Or it could be someone in a couple years started, starts to do these things. Their increased drug or alcohol use, it's a big, big red flag from, you know, someone who had a couple beers a week and um, a couple beers on Friday to someone who's drinking all the time to help stress relief. Big issue. Insomnia, not sleeping or sleeping too much is a major issue as well. Acting recklessly, and this is not, I'm 16 and I'm going to drive the jet ski too fast and that was a good rush, but this is acting recklessly with the intent that they don't care if they live or die. Withdrawal from activities, if they quit a team or if they're not around the team as much, they're pulling back from everyone, they're isolating themselves, they're finding reasons not to show up for parties or holidays or special occasions. And then also Googling or looking for ways to kill themselves. We actually were working with an uh, organization called Go Guardian right now. They're the largest provider of um, Chromebooks in schools. And we're developing software with them that when students in our youth, if they use one of those Chromebooks to Google or to get on a chat page, or they're looking up a video about suicide or mental health or self-harm, it notifies their school counselor and their administration to get that student some help. There's lots of things that we can keep an eye out for. 
And this last one, it can be confusing as well. Giving away possessions is a major sign because people want to leave something behind. They want to make sure that you remember them in a positive way. They'll give you their cherished baseball that Babe Ruth signed. They will start to spend extravagant amounts of money on gifts so that you can remember them in a positive light. It's a big issue. Two of our board members who are volunteers around the state, um, this one really rings true with them, is giving away possessions. Our board chair, Jim, his 18-year-old son, Morgan, died by suicide when he was at Loyola College in Chicago. The summer before, he started buying his three younger brothers these wildly extravagant gifts. Xbox One, Nike shoes for two, three hundred dollars, um, tint on their brother's windows, and he kind of thought, like, wow, like, Morgan is really loving his brothers. He's doing great. He worked hard for that money, and now he looks back when he missed that sign to think about, it was really odd at first, but they convinced themselves that, oh, he's okay, but it was very odd to them, and it was a very big red flag. And mood, so this is the final piece of it. Their mood is up and down, and again, this is a change from the baseline. This is something that people are different about. They're rageful. They go off on a, on a switch, people say sometimes. Um, they're apathetic. They really don't give a, a crap about anything. Um, or they're depressed, or they're just kind of not happy. They have low self-esteem, they have low function. Um, anxiety and irritation are big too. Worrying about stuff all the time. Someone who can't stop worrying about the same thing. And it could have happened 10 years ago. It could have not even happened yet. But something is continuing to worry this person relentlessly and they can't shake the thought. Humiliation's a big piece of it too. Once they've had one of these other mood swings, once they've gone through an apathetic stage and they, they stopped caring about their workload and they got way behind at work and now they're humiliated internally about that, or they had a rageful issue where they were agitated for a while and then they snapped on someone and they were very angry with them and then they're humiliated about that. So all of these things play into it. Yeah. Between like youth hormones and adolescence and the fact that, yeah, it, it's, it's the conversation. It really is. So it's sitting down. You're never going to look at someone from the outside and, and discern, okay, is this just hormones or is this a red flag? There's a conversation to be had. You know, buddy or, you know, my daughter, or my son, whichever one it is, why is this going on? What's going on? Can you help me understand what you're going through? Because through that conversation and that openness, you're going to get to the root cause. And whether it's the answer is, I don't know why I feel this way. I just do. That's a sign of a mental illness study them because if they don't know what's happening to themselves, it's there a lot of times our youth are unable to verbalize what they're going through. And that's where it's it needs to be the stigma removed of simple counseling or therapy can go a long, long way. So when we have a youth who is feeling anxious and moving through something or having a problem and we have a conversation, they don't know how to explain it, have them go talk to somebody else who's trained in this so they can help them explain it, they can help them verbalize what's going on and then we can see okay is this something that passes and they kind of come out of it or is this something that's lingering for two to four weeks so that's kind of the next piece of it these are things that stick around for two to four weeks at a time so if these are not going away in a couple months if these are things that you're you're actually worrying and they're reoccurring and reoccurring and reoccurring we've got to step in and have that conversation and so this is really important is to trust your gut and have that conversation because, again, you're never going to discern whether this is a red flag and a warning sign or if is this just youth hormones and them maturing and being awkward. This is something, too, that assume you're the only one that will reach out. A lot of times we have conversations amongst ourselves about someone, and this happened, and this is, um, this is hard for me because my buddy QB, who died in college, he was my fraternity brother, um, we went to Western Michigan University, go Broncos. Um, I wasn't good. We weren't good enough to make the club team. We did try out for it, but we, we got cut. Um, but we played youth hockey. We played men's hockey. And, you know, we played hockey three nights a week in college. It was awesome. It was someone's beer league, and someone's actually pretty competitive. And there were nights that we would sit around and hang out, and we'd say, man, what's going on with QB? He's missing fraternity meetings. He got in a fight last week on the ice. He, he wasn't himself. We would talk about this all the time. When he wasn't there. And six months later, he was dead. And so for us, we had to deal with the issue that, like, we talked about him. We didn't talk to him. And so that's where you have to talk. Talk saves lives. These three simple words are the most powerful thing that I've ever done and seen in my 10-plus years in nonprofit. So how do we do this? And again, this part, this really important piece, the signs, the symptoms, the warning signs, it's all in the brochure I'll leave at the back of the room. So please, everyone, do take one when you leave tonight. But how do we do this? It's, 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 it's really tough, and it's scary. The first time I had to do it, it was, I, I was shaking in my boots. Um, do it in private. Ask them directly about suicide. You can't say, 
You're not going to hurt yourself, are you? Uh, you're not going to do anything stupid, are you? Because then you're afraid. You're afraid of the answer. You're afraid of the result. You want to listen to their story. When we have these conversations, if you start talking to the person you're worried about, you will close off and lose them immediately. This is about them talking. And again, express concern, express your support. A lot of this, if you are close enough to have, you know, if you're close to someone that you're noticing these things, usually that concern and that relationship is there. Um, and then engage them to seek mental health. Again, none of us in this room, I'm not, I am not a mental health professional. I have no certifications. I have, I have an assist training that I went through for applied suicide intervention skills training, but I am a salesman. Like, my dad was a used car salesman. Like, it's like through and through. But this is about real professional mental health. Things to avoid is minimizing their feelings. Don't tell them, oh, it's not that bad, or oh, that girl doesn't matter, or oh, that team was a joke, or whatever it is. Don't minimize how they're feeling. And don't have a philosophical debate with them and tell them how much their life is worth living. If I was having this conversation with someone and someone was worried about me and I was at risk for suicide and they said, wow, Steve, you got three beautiful kids. You guys just bought that brand new boat. Like, you, you know, you got all these things to live for, man. How could you possibly, you are losing the person every more word you say. And don't give advice to fix it. Well, you know, I do yoga and that really helps me. Or I, I, go, I go knock some beers back. Or I go play golf. Or I... What you do does not, what works for you. What you do will not probably work for them. And again, those simple things that we think we can just fix it with an activity or, oh, why don't you try working out or going for a run? That's part of it, but that's not real treatment. If you are concerned about someone who's in immediate danger, stay with them. Um, remove access to lethal means, whether that's removing a firearm from the home, taking their car keys, or removing them from a high ledge or balcony if they live in a high rise. Um, and escort them again to mental health services. These two resources are on everything that we produce. Um, this is the National Crisis Lifeline, 1-800-273-TALK, or 1-800-273-8255. It's on the brochure I'll leave in the back as well. Um, this Crisis Lifeline is not only for those who are the one in crisis, the, the child, the loved one, the aunt, the uncle, but it's also for you in the room. If you want to have this conversation, and, and today's presentation is not enough to, to give you the confidence and encouragement to do that, you can call this crisis lifeline, and a coach will walk you through how to have a conversation with someone you're worried about. So it's two folds there. The crisis text line, you can talk, text the word TALK to 741741. When Chester Bennington died, this had its highest volume in its existence um, until Anthony Bourdain died. The Saturday after Anthony Bourdain died, they fielded 10,000 calls on a Saturday night and over 15,000 text responses. So again, this contagion effect of the fact of how we report and how we offer services and resources in these stories and intertwine the education and prevention piece to the reporting, we're affecting a lot of lives. But these are 24-7, 365, and also the crisis lifeline is really great because it's fielded by local call centers so no matter where you are in the state of Michigan, the closest call center will be there to answer the call. So they'll have intimate knowledge of community resources, mental health professionals, and it's, it's structured that way so that someone in Georgia doesn't answer a phone call from someone in Alaska and they're not able to help them connect to services. This is not only about crisis mitigation, but it's about resource connection as well. So our local call centers are very well versed in being able to connect with local resources. In an emergency, we do want you to call 911. If it is a life-threatening emergency, someone has the access to lethal means, someone is in the process of an attempt, um, we do need to intervene with life-saving emergency response. So 911 is our last resort. But the issue is, is that these three simple words can really help change our culture. This is a major issue. There's a lot of things that tie it to social media and bullying and generations don't understand why Older generations didn't have this problem, and now this generation does. There's so many questions. And AFSP is the largest suicide prevention um, nonprofit in the nation. We're a nationwide 501c3. We have chapters in all 50 states, um, including Alaska and Hawaii. So we're working very hard to, one, not only fund the research that we need to better understand this illness and answering those tough questions about does social media affect it, does this generation have a different disparity to this? You know, we're looking at how to really understand this. If you look at the funding for major other, other major health issues, um, HIV and AIDS, which in the year from 2004 to 2014, in that 10 year span, HIV and AIDS had a 54% decrease in their mortality rate. 
That disease has not changed since the 80s when we discovered it. What we do know is how we better fight it. We have better medication, we have better treatment, we have a better understanding of what we're dealing with. They received $262 billion from the federal government in research to HIV and AIDS. Heart disease got $112 billion. Suicide prevention got $37 million from the federal government last year for, for funding research. So it's a bigger issue, it's a very complex issue, but it starts with today's presentation, an, inter an introduction, in education that this is preventable. And whether someone is in crisis today or tomorrow, or they were in crisis last week, we can still reach out and we can still connect with them. Again, if you have lost someone to the issue of suicide, we're there to help you and bring hope to the fact that you can get through it and heal. Um, but if you'd like any of this information, please let me know. Um, we can really, starting with these presentations, we do all over the state and all over the country, um, education is key, and we can change the culture, and we can help save more lives. So if you want to get involved, please reach out to me. We're on social media, um, and thanks for listening. There you go. We'll have a Q&A. Yeah, we have a Q&A. I think it's, it kind of depends on where you're at in the continuum of, have you had an issue with it yet? Are you seeing some of these signs and symptoms, or do you want to just be a proactive member of the association, right? We're seeing a lot more schools even nowadays reach out and do this training and education before they have a suicide. In years past, it was a reaction to a death of a student. So yes, I would figure out a way to bridge the conversation, um, even if it's just labeled as a parent education night, or you could do some sort of resource and community fair, or simply just providing literature and information to the group and to the members of the association. Um, the materials that I'll leave here tonight are free to all of you guys. We have a whole suite and host of materials that we produce here locally, whether it's after a suicide, we have a brochure about after a suicide attempt, um, our Talk Saves Lives brochure has a lot of great information in it, so I would invite you and encourage you to, yes, breach the subject. Find a way that it's comfortable, and again, just like today, it was on the agenda and it's an important topic, and so we would love to come and present at an association meeting. Um, if you're comfortable with the topic enough, this whole thing is scripted. It is a scripted, I'm not, like, I didn't make this up. Um, people, someone else tells me what to say. Um, so you can learn this, you can get involved with it if you're comfortable with it, or again, if you're local to me, I'll come do it. If you're somewhere else in the greater state, I will find someone to come do it. So yeah, I would invite all of you to talk about it. Your reporting, I'm not gonna be able to speak on, right? That's gonna be something that either Maha as an association or USA Hockey, it's a, bit, it's a bigger conversation for them to really spell out for you your reporting guidelines and what you're mandated to report on. Um, I guess I would liken it to if you know a student um, was at a school and had these issues and had seen the counselor and said these same things and they transferred schools. You know, how do we make sure that new district knows it's coming in? A lot of times you can't know that unless, again, they come forward and have the conversation. And so you did the exact right thing to bring in the parents and just say, hey, this was said to me. I want to make you aware, like, have you dealt with this? Are you dealing with this? Have you heard this before? Um, just to start the conversation. If they leave the association, they're no longer with your group, um, you could try to follow up and send them with information or if you, but again, once it, and that's the hard part with this. And that, that breach of trust, that, that moment of anger is very common, especially when we breach this to individuals or when we report to someone that this is going on, there's, there is usually a lot of anger. It's the same as if you were to tell a drug addict or an alcoholic that they have a problem, there's usually a lot of anger at first. They can't admit it, right? Because they don't feel safe or they don't feel equipped or they don't know what's going on. And so with our youth, you did the right thing by bringing his family into it. Um, I would always ask, do they have medical insurance? Do they have someone that can get him to see treatment? Do they have these things? And if his family chose to pull him from the association because of this issue, um, it really depends on how close you were to pursue and to follow up. We've had schools that will call CPS because uh, uh, there is an apparent and inherent risk with this student and parents are refusing to give that child treatment. That's endangering the student's life at a, at a certain level. So there's resources within the school. So if you knew what school he could go, he went to, you could reach out to the school and say, hey, I was his coach. I wanted to let you guys know this happened. Um, but again, there are reporting structures within USA Hockey and Maha that, you'll have, that they'll need to get better versed in with what your guys' kind of protocol is. And we have that with a lot of schools ask us that. I go and give this presentation, and a teacher will raise their hand and say, so what's my reporting like ethics or if this kid says this to me? And I kind of go, We're here to breach, the, you know, and we, we have model school policies, so we have policy for districts, that, so it could even, but not this. I, we're, we're working hard. 
Questions? All right. Well, thank you guys for listening. I would encourage you. Yeah. Um, if you want to get involved, we do have tons of walks all over the state. So we have a walk in Marquette. We have a walk in Traverse City. We have walks everywhere in the state. So um, all that information will be in the back table. Please look us up, get involved. And if you need anything else, please reach out. Thank you.